a Canadian, I have watched them with amazement all my life. Self-centered yet generous, argumentative, fiercely individualistic and strongly conformist all at once. Thank you. If they have one common faith, it's that they and no one else have got democracy right. And isn't it a great time to be in America? To be living here today well, The flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away And I'm proud to be an American But at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died Gave that right to me And I gladly stand up Next to you After the fall of Athens, for about 2,000 years, democracy was a bad word. It meant the rule of the ignorant many, the poor, the incompetent. But when democracy surfaced again on American shores, it was driven by a new idea. Personal freedom, the right of individuals to do what they wanted to do, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Where did that idea come from? Certainly not from ancient Athens. American democracy, the achievement they celebrate endlessly as their own unique invention, in fact has roots set deep in the soil most of their forebears came from, medieval Europe. To be born in the Middle Ages meant doing what you were told by the princes and the church in Rome. The pattern of your life was fixed at birth. Then in 1517, a Catholic priest named Martin Luther nailed to the door of his church here in Wittenberg a notice that would shake the foundations of that fixed and inescapable way of life. The debate was over who gets to talk to God. Luther translated the Bible into German, printed it, and made it directly accessible to the people without their needing a priest to tell them what it meant. It was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation with its revolutionary new idea that the individual was directly responsible to God. Martin Luther meant it to apply only to the power of the church, but it was an idea that would soon challenge the power of the feudal lords and monarchs. The press that had printed Bibles soon moved on to politics, New concepts of self-government swept through the countrysides of Europe, challenging the right of the aristocracy to own both the land and the people. In England, the village of Fen Stanton was a stopover on the high road to London, and among the villagers exposed to tavern talk about that rapidly changing world outside was a family named Howland. Now here we have the entry in the burial register for the year 1629, for Margaret Howland. And that's John's mother. That is John's mother, the wife of Henry. Europe was bursting with ideas, but its yellowing old institutions offered little room to try them out. Young John Howland must have heard talk of a second Eden, this place where you could start again. America. In 1620, Howland signed on for a voyage on a ship called the Mayflower with a group of dissident English Protestants we now know as the Pilgrim Fathers. They had with them a charter to establish a colony in Virginia, but their navigator took them quite a bit off course.
Daybreak, Saturday, November the 11th, 1620. The Mayflower lay at anchor roughly 200 miles north of its intended landing point. Well beyond the limits of its charter, beyond the authority of the colonial governor, the 128 people on board were on their own. After breakfast and morning psalms, the leaders of the voyage summoned the men into the great cabin to read a document they had prepared the day before. Oh, you worship. In the name of God, amen. We whose names are underwritten do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one of another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. It wasn't a democratic document so much as a way of curbing the potential lawlessness of some of the colonists. But it did contain one principle that 150 years later would become crucial to the founding of the United States of America. Government based upon a written constitution and not one given them by a king or any external power. The people were declaring that they had the right to form themselves into a body politic. Half the colony died that first winter. But within seven years, Plymouth Plantation grew into the village portrayed in this living museum. And John Howland rose from his position of servant to become assistant governor of the colony, something he would never have dreamed possible in the Europe he'd left behind. Americans like to think that they own democracy, that they invented it. And I think some people have the idea that the Pilgrim Fathers brought democracy over with them on the Mayflower and unloaded it along with their baggage on Plymouth Rock. Well, the Pilgrims were self-reliant and resourceful people, but they were also authoritarian and intolerant, and they certainly were not Democrats. It does seem to me that uh, the great mass of the people are not very capable of ruling themselves. Yet is it not set forth in scripture that a man should have uh, his proper place, and it is given by God. So you do not think this democracy would be a very good idea? No, it was uh, near anarchy, I would say. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. 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 The Pilgrim Colony was a strict society. There was no freedom of speech, no freedom of movement in trade or religion. And yet they did demonstrate that a group of Englishmen could govern themselves without a governor appointed by the king. And from the seeds of the Mayflower Compact grew a real democratic tradition. There are still New England communities where, in the annual town meeting, the people themselves set their own taxes and choose their own officials. The office of auditor. Any nominations from the floor? We've got to have somebody. <laughs> Richard Brokaw's name has been placed in nomination. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those that oppose, Richard Brokaw is auditor for three years. The community gets together here to make decisions that affect their lives directly. And this has been called the purest form of democracy. It's direct democracy, no representatives. This is face-to-face -face consensus building or open voting on issues. John? For 150 years after Plymouth, New Englanders governed themselves by small local assemblies like this one in Stratford, Vermont. It was truly government by the people, and it worked. Those who couldn't go along with the majority were free to leave or were sometimes banished. But there was always room for them to go somewhere else and set up their own town or state. Those who oppose say no. The ayes have it. Article 4 is adopted. But finally it was 1776 and the Declaration of Independence. And for the first time, this collection of small towns and independent states had to start working together if they were going to become this vast new nation. But for 11 years, they clung to their differences and their independence. Each state collected its own taxes, printed its own money, sometimes conducted its own foreign policy. The country was coming apart. There was only one thing to do, 
something that Americans do really well. They called a meeting. Two hundred years ago, right here, a group of men gathered to discuss a new system of government. And today we celebrate a constitution for the United States of America. Constitution has now survived 200 years. I arrived in Philadelphia in time for the celebration. Flags, parades, brass bands, hot dogs, the kind of pageantry Americans excel at. On the right hand side, you see the old Pennsylvania State House, of course, we call it Independence Hall. Inside that building is where both the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution were signed. They call it one of America's most historic buildings, and certainly one of the oldest buildings in the city of Philadelphia. Out the door to your left, okay, and up the stairs, and I'll see you in the long gallery there. The men who gathered at these tables were certainly not Democrats. They closed the windows despite the summer heat. And they posted a guard at the door so that the people and the press couldn't hear what they were talking about. They even flirted with the idea of a monarchy. And they explicitly did not want the people of America to choose through direct election their president. These men didn't trust the people. The howling masses, Alexander Hamilton called them. The people never judge right, he said give the first class a permanent place in government. That meant the property class. Jerry of Massachusetts said that all our evils stem from an excess of democracy. And Randolph of Virginia worried that electing the Congress would mean too much democracy. The rights that most of these men were concerned about were the rights of property. Now, there were some who were fighting for human rights, individual rights. But finally, the one thing that they could all agree on was the danger of a too powerful central government. And so the brilliant compromise that they worked out was this. The people would be sovereign, but they would be kept out of the day-to-day -day workings of government by the representative process. So the power of the central government was checked, but so was the power of the people. Finally, what they had succeeded in doing was making this dangerous thing, democracy, safe. What they had done in Philadelphia was to hold the huge, faltering young nation together, but it was still a nation run by the rich, the landowners, the merchants, the New York bankers. It would be another 40 years before the people would have something to celebrate. The 1820s marked the real arrival of democracy in America. For the first time, a man of the people was elected president, Andrew Jackson. On the night of his inauguration, thousands of his supporters flooded into the White House, some riding horses right through the front door. To the bankers of New York, it looked like mob rule, something that had been feared since the time of Athens. We have a portrait of this new era. In 1831, a young French aristocrat named Alexis de Tocqueville came to the New World, officially to examine the prison system, but really to take a look at democracy in America. Something he thought would be the future of the whole world. His inquiry brought him here to Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, at that time a model of prison reform. When the prison first came here, black people was put over their heads so they would never see another 
10 meter out of contact. By modern standards, Eastern State looks harsh. Prisoners were led to their cells with hoods over their heads and then left to serve their term in total isolation with nothing but a Bible for company. But these cells echoed the founding ideals of America itself, that anyone could start again, given a second chance. Now this is Johnny Bauer's cell. He spent eight and a half years in solitary confinement in this particular cell. In de Tocqueville's Europe, prisons were where criminals waited for their punishment by flogging or branding or hanging. But in America, personal liberty was so valued that prison itself was considered punishment. Democracy to me is, is key word is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of being able to do what you want in this country, freedom of being able to go where you want, when you want, with whom you want, and being able to do what you want when you want to do it. Waking up, going to work, support your family, being free, and, you know, do what you want, work. Instead of being a rat communist and they tell you what to do. Ask any American nowadays what democracy means, and most will reply, like these New Yorkers, liberty, freedom of the individual. Freedom to drive to work alone, competing all the way. Freedom to set up a shop and make a buck, maybe a million, with minimal interference from the state. But in the 1830s, de Tocqueville was struck most by the appearance of equality. The whole country seems to have melted into one middle class, he wrote. Everywhere he saw the same clothes, same attitude, same language, same habits, same pleasures. It is not American to be different. And there lay the danger, he said. Even in liberty, Americans were slaves of a crushing conformity which elevated the common man and enshrined the mediocre. De Tocqueville called it the tyranny of the majority. But there was an escape from that tyranny. To the west, a vast continent beckoned to that restless race of Americans. It was an age of hope, of unlimited optimism. Everything seemed possible. And it was the frontier that seemed to make that dream accessible to all. The migration of ordinary Americans pushed westward to the mountains and beyond. This same train once carried a young man from North Dakota, who, like so many others, was looking for that second start. Cowboy, prize fighter, writer. He's America's storyteller. Louis Lamour. What did you expect to find when you came up here when you were 19 years old? I didn't really know. I was looking for a job in the mines. What did you find? I didn't find a job. I found some beautiful countries I love. Now, with 200 million books printed, mostly Westerns, Lemur has been called the fastest pen in the West. Well, Louis, was your family uh, unusually restless with all this wandering around? No, it was typical. That was going on all over the country. The people were migrating west, you know. They started from the very beginning, always pushing west. The history of America actually is history of families moving. They're moving in a new country, in a pioneer country. How much do you think this search for new horizons shaped the way in which the American democracy developed? I think it had a great deal to do with it. The cattle barons almost tried to set up a feudal system, but it didn't work because it was too democratic a situation. A cowboy could be working for somebody, but he could quit tomorrow and ride off into the sunset. The West has been the safety valve of American democracy. A place to start again with new rules, or maybe no rules. Young men went West to make their fortunes in the mines, or to lose them in towns like Silverton, Colorado. But the West was never as wild as its reputation. The early settlers here showed an instinct for rough justice and self-government. Where no government existed, they would create their own. So when they, when they first started to set up a town, I mean, how did you set up a town? It was the miners first, and then I guess they had to have some services. Yes, but the first thing they usually set up was a saloon. And uh, that was also a clearinghouse for information. A saloon wasn't just a place to drink, it was a place to gather and meet. Kind of it's, a verbal post office. That's right. The next thing usually was a general store, and then a church and a school would follow immediately after. And uh, usually the businesses grew up in two different directions. On one side of the street there was the red light district 
and the saloons and the gambling houses, the other side of the street with the churches and the schools and, and the good citizens. This is Blair Street, so one side of this would have been Blair Street the good side and one side of Van Sant. No, Blair, Blair Street was all bad. Oh, Green one. Street over here was the good street. <laughs> Louis, how did they go about running a town, seeing that the streets are kept clean or whatever you had to do to them, seeing that there's a water supply, doing all that homey stuff that is necessary if you're going to run a community? How did they organize it? These people came from back east. Many of them were veterans of the New England town meetings. They understood politics, and the, one of the first things they did was to get together to organize a town. They, were, they would elect a mayor, and they would elect a consul sometimes three to five people, something in that area, and they would, they would plan right then for getting rid of refuse, taking dead animals out of the street, disposing of bodies, directing the law, whatever it was. It was a very, very democratic period. It was in rooms like this where a lot of democracy actually began. It was a place where men met. Men got together and they could exchange ideas there. Arguments would develop, of course, and people would talk and exchange ideas, and out of that would come the formulation of the city government. Louis, would you go so far as to say that if it hadn't been for the West, or for the frontier, that we wouldn't have the kind of America we know now? I'm quite sure of that. It would be very, very different. The men out on the frontier, one of the things very clear cut. Hey. They were all strong, they were all individualists, and they insisted their government give them freedom, all the freedom they wanted. They got the idea that they didn't need anybody or anything, and actually they didn't. Okay, Jeff, you don't need to barbecue him again. All the people were real independent because uh, they had nobody to look after them, they had to look after themselves, they had to band together and and make them up a little set of laws for their community or, or and elect their sheriff or whatever. The government wasn't involved in it. We got too much government making it rough on all of us. It's too much government. That's right. Too much control or relax. When my grandfather came out here for freedom, I'm sure of that. So did my father and my uncles and uh, most all of the neighbors around here. And at that time, they had practically complete freedom. And uh, today, that's gone. Yeah. Lots of people say, oh my God, just look around. You've got the whole outdoors. You've got the whole world by the tail. Yeah, well, to them it looks like that. To me, it looks like it's closing in on us and choking us to death. It's people, people, people coming all the time. And it's just uh, got to be a tight world. Good morning, Chuck. You know, if you have to be stuck in traffic, well, at least it's a gorgeous day, huh? Boy, that's for sure. Just spent some time looking at traffic up Zapota Pass. Boy, is it busy today. Eastbound 22 freeway right at the Santa Ana. Got a couple of cards there on the way to the body shop. Up in Yellow Thunder, this is Commander Chuck Street for KISS FM. It is 831 right now. L.A. weather got sunny and dry skies today. Yeah. Americans are still traveling west, as far west as they can go. Still looking for that second start. Still hoping to find the dream. Stewart, his sister, brother-in-law, and three children, all set off for Los Angeles three months ago. They had been making good money in Texas until the bottom dropped out of the oil industry. They didn't expect to end up living in their car under a bridge on the edge of Los Angeles. Construction subs needed. All trades in all areas to start work immediately. Read to call that one real quick. So they told us there was work here, so we come down here. It's kind of exciting at first. Well, we ran out of money. <laughs> we ran out of stuff to feed the kids and everything, and this is the only place you can park without, without going to jail or being harassed by the police. They tell you to come out of here and park underneath an underpass and do the best you can. California's land of milk and honey. It is. There's more money out in this state, I think, than any other state. But you got to be able to grasp it. You got to figure out how. I want them to have a nice home. This is my outlook. I want to take care of my wife. I want to take care of my kids. I want them not to have to worry about nothing. It's hard to get started, but I believe we can do it. A new life, that's what we need. 
make a new life. Start over. There was a time in America when democracy meant the freedom to sink or swim. Then the government stepped in to curb the winners and help the losers of society. The people demanded it. But that in turn has created a massive bureaucracy of more than 16 million employees. Number 51. Ordinary citizens have become numbered clients of the state, more and more cut off from real power over their own lives. Do you have your fingerprints and your medical report? Yes. To many Americans, big government and big bureaucracy are no longer the solution to the problem. They are the problem. The Stringfellow site opened about 1956, and it started receiving waste from all over Southern California. Take, for example, the story of Penny Newman. During the period that Stringfellow operated, we had about 34 million gallons of chemicals dumped up here. They included... Just uh, eight years ago, Penny Newman was, by her own description, the average middle-class housewife. Two kids, scout den mother, member of the PTA living one hour's drive southeast of Los Angeles in a bedroom community called Glen Avon. Many things that are considered uh, carcinogens, um, as well as affecting every other part of your body. And what did it look like then she realized that toxic chemicals were leaking into Glen Avon from a dump site known as Stringfellow in a canyon above the town. One of the big problems is that it would fill up with rains and run off all the way down this area. Um, until it worked its way down the canyon. So that when we had heavy rains, these chemicals, 34 million gallons of chemicals, would overflow the dam and run down into the community, across our yards, across the school, down public roads. Our kids played in it, and we didn't even know it. This is the type of issue that takes those numbered clients and turns them back into citizens. When Penny Newman's children came home from school complaining of dizziness and nausea, she knew it was time to stand up and speak out. The longer we wait, the more we will contaminate our drinking water. We will continue to expose people to these hazardous chemicals, and the people of Glen Avon will not take it any longer. She did all the right things. She organized a community. She carried a picket sign, handed out leaflets, appeared on local television news. She lobbied the politicians. She went to the environmental committees and the public hearings on toxic waste. It's not the people in Sacramento who have to live with that site. It's not the people in Washington that have to live with that site. It is my family and my friends. It was an eight-year battle and it left her disillusioned. I guess I've become much more cynical about politicians. Why? Because it's gone against everything that I grew up believing. Which was what? Um, well, I really believe that you elected people um, and they would take care of things. I believe that agencies were there to do what they were hired to do, which was to protect people. And my experience has been that they don't. And what I find is that unless people yell, a lot of them get ignored. Well, if the, if the elected representatives are not representing the interests of the people, who are they representing? What are they there for? Well, I'm, I'm finding that elected officials primarily are there to get re-elected. You know, they're there to uh, look good, um, do some token bills, um, but get the money so that they have money to run in the next campaign. And that seems to be the overwhelming um, priority for them. Would you like some milk? Yeah, please. Um, you can't keep people involved at the citizen action level just by preaching at them? No, I don't believe that people are apathetic at all. Um, I believe that people don't take actions when they don't know what they should do. And um, if you show them how they can influence the system, they're more than eager to get in and help solve problems. California voters have a way of getting around the political and bureaucratic logjam. They collect signatures on a petition to put referendum questions onto the ballot. State measures, which if they're accepted, pass directly into law. Penny Newman helped collect more than 600,000 signatures in support of a measure to restrict the dumping of toxic chemicals into drinking water. It was called Proposition 65. 
Proposition 65 was the result of a lot of people trying to put something on the ballot so that the people could vote on that would actually make a difference to those of us who continue to be exposed to toxic chemicals. On Tuesday, I hope all of you will bring your friends to the polls and vote yes on 65. Proposition 65 has the support of Los Angeles' most visible minority, Hollywood stars. In California, this actually works. All the stars coming today was what really made me want to vote. I usually don't even vote until this happened. With all the stars coming, this is really going to make me vote. I would have expected politicians to support the people on safe drinking water, but the governor, George Duke Majin, has come out against Proposition 65. His critics point out that he has accepted substantial campaign contributions from industries that produce and use toxic chemicals. Behind the scenes, these same industries are kicking in millions to defeat Proposition 65. Proposition 65 is supported by Hollywood movie stars, mostly, and opposed by Governor Duke Majin, the California Medical Association. This ad gives the impression that the fight's not between the people and industry, but between the Hollywood stars and the experts. Now, you could follow the advice of your favorite Hollywood stars or the experts who know what they're talking about. Vote no on Proposition 65. It's important. Election Day, the great American pastime. Once every two years, they get their chance to vote the heroes into office and throw the rascals out. Many will play no other part in the democratic process. But today, in 23 states, voters don't just elect representatives, they also make law, directly pulling on the levers of power through referendum questions on the ballot. Here in California, Proposition 65 has been one of the hottest issues in the campaign. It's a reminder of the direct democracy of the old town meeting. So why don't they use it? This time, barely a third of the eligible voters have even bothered to show up. Yep, you Decision 86 continues from the California desk here, and uh, we are projecting another low, winner in tonight's many, many, many races. We have re-elected our governor. We have thrown our Supreme Court justice out. Proposition 65 was the Toxics Initiative, uh, supported by a wide variety of famous people, and it has passed also this evening by a healthy majority. It's my honor to declare that we have won over... <laughs> I went into that celebration and we were very ecstatic that uh, we got 63% of the vote. Everyone was really, had a very high hopes for it. There was no way that the governor couldn't implement it the way people thought it was. Well, we found out not too far beyond that, uh, that the governor didn't implement it. That uh, passing an initiative wasn't the only way to do it. I mean, that... That wasn't the end of the story. Leader, you'll give us their name. By the Constitution of California, once a proposition is passed by the people, it becomes law of the state. But four months after the election, Governor Duke Majin was still dragging his heels on implementing the full force of Proposition 65. Of a list of more than 200 chemicals considered by agencies of the United Nations and the U.S. government to cause cancer, the governor had banned only 29 from being dumped into drinking water. They had to take the governor to court to force him to ban the rest. So it's been a real battle. My past experience with politicians had shown me that not to hold your hopes up very high because they usually disappoint you, but I thought something initiated from the people, as the initiative was supposed to be, should have reached our hopes. Too many people, we were kind of lulled into this idea that all you have to do, your responsibility is you go to the poll and you vote for one of these jerks running for an office and that they will take care of everything. And what I've learned firsthand is that that is not what makes things happen. So what are the lessons, Penny? I think what I've learned is that, that the real motivating factor, the real influence into this whole process what American democracy is, 
is that people have to take that responsibility. They have to get involved. They have to demand that their uh, desires be met. People are quick to participate when the family's health is threatened. But to keep people involved in the ongoing day-to-day -day tasks of democracy takes work like this. And I'm with North Carolina Fair Share. Getting support in the neighborhood with names. In 24 states of the nation, citizen action groups go direct to the grassroots. They knock on over 50,000 doors five nights a week, 12 million homes a year, trying to get ordinary folk, the old, the poor, and the powerless, out from behind their screen doors. Okay, I could give you a phone number to call that you could, that you might be able to get. They your call answer. it taking democracy to the doorstep, and they have enrolled a potent force of 1.6 million into a national coalition of citizen action groups. And by backing that up with a contribution. This is where the complex American system comes alive. Americans join everything. It's the lifeblood of democracy. Thousands of associations, unions, lobbies, pressure groups, all aimed at one final target. The representative. Senator Paul Simon is the darling of those citizen action groups. They helped elect him senator. But when he launched his campaign for the Democratic presidential nomination, he knew he'd need more than their goodwill. Simon thinks he needs to raise between four and a half and five million dollars. Is that to get the nomination? That's to get the nomination. That kind of money's not raised by knocking on doors. Much of it has to come from powerful interest lobbies, 9,000 based here in Washington alone. Inevitably, that distorts the representative process. Let me give you a very practical illustration. You make a contribution, and I'm grateful to people who make contributions. I've never promised anyone anything for a contribution. But uh, if tonight I get home at midnight, and there are 20 phone calls waiting for me, 19 of them from people whose names I don't recognize, the 20th is someone who gave me a $500 campaign contribution. At midnight, I'm not going to make 20 phone calls. I might make one. Which one do you think I'm going to make? Well, it means that those who have, who are financially more articulate, have inordinate access to policymakers. I have never promised a soul a thing for a contribution. But I would be fooling you if I said that the present system hasn't from time to time probably distorted my voting record. Increasingly in our own democracy, uh, the role of uh, money has continued to play uh, an extraordinary uh, level of influence. Too much? Too much, much too much. This is, I think, becoming an increasing problem. A uh, common cause, uh, one of the citizens action groups in our country that's, I think, uh, admirable in its uh, nature, has this as a, as a major goal to reduce the influence of these uh, highly effective, very wealthy, uh, very generous uh, contributors to certain uh, candidates' political campaigns. What we are talking about is power. Do Americans have sufficient means to make the decisions that most affect their lives? Or has that power been usurped by the bureaucracy, by special interest groups, by money, or even by the unchecked or unelected? A lot of people are now saying that it's time for America to make its own second start, and that this means going back to the very roots of their democracy. Boston is where so much of it began. Tourist pamphlets call it the cradle of liberty, the Athens of America. But I remember a different Boston, one with fires and rioting in the streets where black kids are being bussed under police guard into white neighborhoods, and this Athens nearly tore itself apart with racial bitterness. It was an attempt by the courts to integrate the black minority into a system that had for so long shut them out. It didn't work. This inner city community, Roxbury, still looks to me like a black ghetto. It's a stark and depressing contrast to the affluence of most of Boston. The scars of the 60s riots are still visible, like craters on an old battlefield. Black community leaders say that Roxbury gets less than its fair share of city services. They say its residents are still second-class citizens. I don't think things have gotten better since the 60s. As a matter of fact, I think things have gotten worse. 
And you can look around, you look at the garbage on the street, you look at the burned out buildings, you look at the vacant lots, there's no other area of the city of Boston, as a matter of fact, there's no other area in Massachusetts that looks like this. I think there's a thin class of professionals and politicians who are doing better, who have more access to the system, but they don't bother to look out of the window of their Mercedes and BMWs and see that the garbage has been on the street so long that it's fossilized. A lot of black people have accepted the notion that the majority of black folks in America are going to be poor and ignorant. I don't accept that. I think the essence of democracy is local people who control their day-to-day -day affairs. And when you have people who feel that there's lack of control or those who do control do not have their best interests in mind, then I think that those people have every right and even an obligation to assume that form of government, and that's what we're trying to do. This is a revolution for the 80s. Black activists telling the people of Roxbury it's time to seize power in their own backyard. Power over health care, housing, transportation, social services, and most important, the development of those vacant lots. Power is now in the hands of the downtown establishment. Morning. Hope you're able to come to that tomorrow. Bob Terrell is chairman of the Greater Roxbury Neighborhood Association. It lays claim to being something like an informal community government one that takes its authority directly from the people themselves. Right, to our next Rossbury Town Meeting. Rossbury Town Meeting. The town meeting idea sounds like the very earliest forms of democracy in America, where people make direct legislative decisions by themselves. Is that what you're after? Yes. I think what we're trying to do is plant the seeds for a completely new system of democracy based on direct democracy. You mean it's everybody true. getting together and really voting and saying, here's what we're going to do, and well, making legislation and I, meetings? I think what you see throughout Roxbury, in fact, throughout the city of Boston, people want to speak for themselves. They're tired of being represented. They want to represent their own point of view. Tonight's meeting is going to be a town meeting around transportation issues. The official voice of Roxbury belongs to Gloria Fox. At 45, a grandmother, Fox has been elected twice to the state legislature. There will be transportation available. Folks um, just need to call in to the GRNA office. Fox ran for office in order to get more power and money for her community. You know what I wanted to do? I wanted to get the... Um, but real power, she says, must come out of the people making decisions themselves. And she works closely with Terrell's Neighborhood Association. You will, so that I can get um, them listed already. We only have about four people that have called. Fox is a politician who began as a local activist and still keeps close to the streets. This has been the side of my district that has been long neglected. The investment in this area has been nil for about 20 years. Why do people in this community feel as deeply as they apparently do, that they can't get a handle on things themselves. Why do they feel dispossessed and disempowered? Not, that's, you know, democracy is for those to take handle on it. I, I think that's how I feel about it. And I feel as though the people, the community people that I work with, that are organizing themselves, that are fighting back, fighting the gentrification and the speculation that's going on, I think those folks have, have a clear handle on how democracy is going to work for them. In other words, that might mean that they have to take charge and do some things themselves. For nearly 200 years, Boston was governed by the town meeting, and that old idea has never escaped the American imagination. Boston outgrew the town meeting. But Roxbury has revived it, and I went along with Representative Fox to see if it still has a place in the American system. But does the system still have a place for Roxbury? Andrew Jones has been demanding for years that it separate from Boston, raise its own taxes, and run its own government based on the principle of the town also, meeting. I would suggest to the committee here that there be a referendum this fall on the ballot um, on replacement service for the Orange Line. It gives people an opportunity to state a yay or a nay um, at the ballot, and I think most people would vote yes. I think that the referendum idea is excellent because it is a new way to talk to them. I think we must seriously consider a demonstration. The day where we pay no fears. Our tokens have been melted down. We have no coins. And let us see. We need new ways to talk. Parking down here is one thing, but going downtown is another. 
You're going to go downtown. You're going to have to get something going. You're going to have to demand dignity and respect because they don't care about you unless you put your money where your mouth is or your mouth where your money is where it goes. What we're doing is we're extending the tradition of democracy for people of color. We're tired of Boston telling us what to do. We're tired of big wigs in their little blue suits and, and ties and white shirts telling us what we have to do with our community and bleeding us dry every day. We're saying that we don't have to invent anything new. There's no need for anything new. That the tools that we need were placed in the oldest constitution in the world, the Massachusetts Constitution, 300 years ago, and those tools lie within the municipal incorporation process, and that local government Cities and towns represent the most powerful form of government in the world because they are the means by which the people control their day-to-day -day affairs, and I will believe in that until I'm told otherwise. The State House, Boston. In the next election, Jones wants the politicians to put a question on the ballot, asking the people of Roxbury if they want to separate from Boston. Today on two different bills. The first bill is House 5842, for legislation to authorize the Secretary of the Commonwealth to place upon the ballot in the current year a non-binding question relative to the incorporation of a certain area of the city of Boston as a city within the Commonwealth. Is there anybody here in favor of that bill? My name is Andrew P. Jones. This is not a protest. I'm not complaining about racism, ill treatment, lack of opportunities, so forth and so on, although those factors are real. Rather, we're here to direct you, representatives here, to place this non-binding referendum question on the ballot this fall in Boston. Uh, is there any other witness who wishes to speak? Right here. My name is Chuck Turner, and I'm here to uh, testify in support of the bill. To be part of a country which has worked methodically to keep a part of its population deprived of democratic rights, while at the same time uh, heralding itself as a democracy, is a schizophrenia and a kind of insanity that makes uh, participation uh, in this country very difficult. You can't continue to control the lives and the fates of black people and people of color even though you've done it for 300 years. And if you say no, then without being a prophet of doom, let me just say that the issue will be taken to the streets. Please, 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 We don't want to turn public hearings into a contest who can clap the loudest. Um, is there anybody here who would dare, I mean, who is opposed to the bill? Is there anybody here opposed to the bill? Go right ahead. I don't see anything positive coming from dividing the city of Boston, the city which you and I love so very much, that have spent so much of our time in. I think that more can be done if we work together. We can improve quality of fire service to your neighborhood if arson is a problem. We can get our public officials accountable. Thank you. Is there any other discussion on the motion? Go right ahead. I'll be as brief as possible. <laughs> My name is Alan Shaw. I live at 26 Alpine Street um, in Roxbury. Um, yeah, I'd like to say that I'm a, I'm a pretty young brother, and I realize that people in Roxbury, especially my age, have been pretty quiet. In fact, they've been sleeping. All of us have been asleep. But one thing that wakes people up better than anything else is taking away rights, such as taking away our right to actually hear out this issue. This is supposedly a democracy. This is not South Africa, but it looks more like South Africa every day, especially when we start talking about we're not even going to write to vote on it anymore. So when somebody said that it was going to divide the city, the city is divided now. Nobody lives on my block except black people. I mean, on my block, right? It, the only people out there are black people, and black people have never had a part in taking control of their own neighborhood. This issue is giving me a role to play. It's for once making, their, making a debate and a struggle something that I can take part in. And uh, I don't know what people will say, but at least we have the right to vote. And that's, that's what I want to fight for. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, we have a motion for a favorable House 5842, and I'll call the vote. All those in favor of the favorable motion say aye. 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 All those opposed? The eyes seem to have it. In persistence and determination. Amen. There is hope. And one must never quit. One must never quit. Jones has reason to feel pleased. Now the bill must go before the elected representatives, including its champion, Gloria Fox.
Placement of dealers' insignias, logos, or name plates on motor vehicles. Question comes from Pastor Bill Gross. All those in favor say opposed, no, the I-7 goes past to being gross. On page 7, the question comes on ordering the bill of a third reading. Ms. Fox of Boston. Enough of this. We're only asking for the opportunity eventually, and not just now, but eventually asking for the opportunity to self-govern the community that has been under-respected and underserviced for many, many years. Now, that doesn't say that any other community within the city of Boston or this commonwealth doesn't have the same rights that we have right now in asking for this bill, this piece of legislation, to be taken to third reading. It's an uphill fight. The issue's already been defeated once at the polls. Its supporters have got to persuade the House to reopen old wounds. There is more political excitement around this idea than any idea that I have seen in this community in years. And if this is a way to draw people into the political process, if this is a way to get young people to register and vote, if this is a way to get people to debate these kinds of political issues that are apart from personalities, then I say, why not? If they want to do this, why not let them have the chance? Why not let democracy blossom? And I say, that is what the question is before us. The uh, chair would uh, admonish our visitors that we do not permit demonstrations. Roll call machine will now be open, remain open for six minutes. Time for voting has expired. 65 in the affirmative, 87 in the negative. Two is not ordered to a third reading. Failure? Maybe. But hundreds of people here took handle on the system, and will try again. And maybe none of them, including Gloria Fox, want to separate as much as they want a voice, attention, some sign that even if it's bit by bit, the people do have the power to bring about change. Gloria, calling Greater Roxbury out of Greater Boston sounds to me like a really drastic solution. But it also sounds like a way of saying really the system has totally failed. That's right. To, and the system it really isn't working for the people in this community. That's correct. Now, you're a representative. That's right. In the state legislature. Do you believe that representative democracy is working in this state? Working for the people of... Massachusetts, and particularly the people of Rochester. I think I'm going to continue to struggle with it until there is a <laughs> either. A I, I know I'm putting you on this no, block. Is it working for the people in your community? For some, it is. For some in my community, it is. For others, it isn't. The masses of people, it isn't working for them. But that they were the ones that put me in this office, so I have to struggle to make sure that there is some form of access There's for those people. Kind of nice irony in the fact that we say you're talking about representative democracy and here's Colonel North being quizzed by the Senate Congress Committee. Well, that's a perfect example of the kind of corruption in government and the kind of uh, injustice that goes on in this country that people see every day and people realize is going on. It makes them feel a little bit hopeless. And then there are other examples like myself and other people that are in the community that are committed to changing the quality of life for the masses of people. There's us. Um, you gonna win? In the end, yeah. Of course. There was a time when the people of Roxbury might have packed up and headed west to start again on the edge of the frontier. A time when America was inventing itself from a collection of self-governing small towns, each with its local talk shop. The saloon, the church, the post office, the diner, the general store, the barber shop. That's where they gathered to talk it out. Without debate, there is no democracy. Well, Tom, explain to me exactly how that whole thing developed. And I hear America gearing up for a new debate on its oldest founding principle that everyone has rights. America is a continuing experiment. And if the experimenters sometimes lose sight of what they were after, they've repeatedly shown a great ability to find it again when they need it. 
to renew and enlarge the liberty of all the people. They have forged magnificent tools to protect that liberty. And if they use those tools, there will always be a chance for a second start for America. Thank you.